Hey YouTube, this is City Prepping. I'm uh, actually driving around out here in the mountains uh, in an area nearby where I live, looking at some land right now. Um, definitely looking for some bug out property here in the next six months and uh, thought I'd pull over real quick and do a quick video talking about a subject matter that's been on my, been on my mind for a little while. It's in relation to the conversations that typically come up in the prepper community about uh, civil war, great reset, these different kind of concepts of, uh, you know, hey, let's burn it down and start all over again because, you know, we want things to be different. We want to start over. We want to start fresh. Uh, a lot of people are frustrated with the current system. They feel like it's left them behind or does it work. And what I want to do in this video is just share some points that I learned while living in Afghanistan. Uh, I've shared a few times on the channel that I went to Afghanistan in 2003. I was there for three months. Uh, I did NGO work. I w worked with a team of missionaries, uh, physicians. We provided medical relief and uh, humanitarian aid in the city of Kabul. And I went, you know, as uh, at that time I was an occupational minister and I went to help serve the community. Having said that, I observed uh, the impact of civil war firsthand. And I know a lot of times people are kind of cavalier in the discussion and their attitude of, hey, you know, let's just, let's just start all over again. It, it would be better that we do it that way. Again, I think a lot of that's, uh, you know, out of frustration. And all I can say is firsthand after seeing and living in a nation that had gone through civil war, the time when I got there, uh, they'd gone through having the Russians come in during the late 70s and 80s, and then the early 90s when they had their own collapse with the power vacuums with different warlords fighting for territory. They, in a sense, had their own civil war. And, you know, the, one of the first things that really struck me living there is if you live in a country where there's either been civil war or it's just occurred, uh, things are going to be extremely, extremely difficult. You know, there's this notion and thinking that, hey, um, you know, again, let's just burn it down, start all over. But when you live in a country where everything has been destroyed, the, the thing that impressed me, I remember when we flew into Kabul airport, uh, we had to fly and come in, and the first thing you saw is along the landing strip, everything was destroyed. There was planes that were blown up. You get into the airport, it was destroyed. Um, you know, anything that was vertical, any kind of structure, a building, a telephone pole, you name it, is full of RPG holes or bullet holes. Telephone poles were riddled. Uh, you know, buildings were destroyed. And the people, you know, they unfortunately uh, took the brunt of it. They lived in some of the harshest conditions. I saw buildings, everything was toppled over. There was no sense of... Uh, any type of security, and I'll talk about that more in a second. But this notion of, hey, this almost glamorization of, you know, any type of a civil war, I don't think people have any context or any idea what that looks like living in a country like that. Uh, that's the first thing that really impressed me was just how difficult it was. People that had any talents or any ability, they got the heck out of there. They either went to Germany or other countries where they could start their life and they got their family out or those that were fortunate enough to get out before things started, but the ones that were left behind, you know, were desperately getting, you know, trying to get out. And when I was there, people were always begging, hey, is there any opportunity, any scholarship to get out of here, go to Germany, go to America? Um, and so, you know, if you burn everything down, <laughs> there's not gonna be much left. And that was the thing that really struck me, the first thing that really impacted me. The second thing that really impacted me is a lack of having a control over your own life, your own body, your own family, your own, you name it. Uh, there was no real sense of autonomy. There was, you know, um, again, these people lived in, you know, such desperate areas and it was very primal in a sense, at least when I was there. I don't know how much it's really changed, but you had these different warlords that were over different areas that had kind of taken control. And the thing that you and I love as Americans is our own sense of freedom, again, autonomy. We can do what we want, go where we want. There's no you know, major restrictions or impedance. Uh, but living in a country like that where, again, it's just day-to-day -day survival, you just don't have that luxury. And I remember you know, just even venturing outside of town, you had to be really careful where you pulled over to because there was always areas that had not been demined. Uh, the Russians, when I was there, for every one person in Afghanistan, there was two landmines that were unmapped. And you always saw during, in the city where I was at, there was always all these warnings, you know, for children not to touch what looked like toys. When the Russians left, they left all these uh, mines behind, all these traps more or less to kill kids or maim them or damage them. It was just a real common part of what those people had, you know, gotten used to. But there was no sense of, you know, freedom, autonomy, you know, living your own life. And if you're in a civil war situation, I know one of the shows that's often, you know, mentioned in the prepping community is The Walking Dead and characters like Negan or the, the governor, you know, pop up as, you know, whenever there's a vacuum, these leaders kind of rose to the occasion and took control over areas. And it wasn't too different than what I saw there. Every area had its own, 
you know, un- unique kind of, a, you know, a control and authority. Um, and <laughs> your ability to be this autonomous, you know, freedom-loving individual, that wasn't really that much of an option. Here we enjoy that freedom. Again, I know some people are frustrated by restrictions, but there, there was really no concept of freedom. The third thing that really struck me was a lack of security. We uh, lived in an area, part, a part of a Cabo called Cartese, which means third district, if I remember my diary correctly. And all of the houses in our neighborhood had these huge, massive walls. Uh, and you had what was called a choky door. It was somebody that would work inside your house or inside your little kind of compound to keep watch over, you know, during the day and at night. And, you know, having any kind of security was, there, there wasn't really anybody, any police that you could pick up and call. I mean, there was kind of some loose concepts of police there, but a lot of these guys are ex-military kind of roaming around and, you know, trying to provide help and protection. But there really wasn't a concept of security. You're kind of on your own. Now, again, some may look at that and say, yeah, you know, I've got guns or I've got this and that. But when you're living in an environment, always having to look over your shoulder, always, you know, more or less stressed out, never knowing, you know, what's going to be next. Um, that was really tough. And, you know, if you look at the studies that show the impact of stress, what it does to a person and shortens their lifespan. A lot of these people that we dealt with and, you know, had to deal with on a daily basis, we had a medical clinic at Kabul University. We were, you know, trying to help. Uh, some of the guys on our team, you know, were different types of, uh, you know, different type of therapists, and they saw firsthand the impact of what stress did to these people. And that kind of leads me into the next point, the fourth point, which is a shorter lifespan. When you live with a constant state of stress, you're at a basic molecular deterioration level, or rather you experience that at a molecular level where stress really accelerates that process, where your life is now going to be shorter. Uh, I mean, you can study enough, and there's not there's tons of evidence the impact that stress has on people's lives. And when you're living in a constant state of survival every day, you're barely making it. I mean, when I was there, the average professor would make about $75 USD a month if they were lucky, if they got paid. And, you know, seeing that firsthand was, it, it really struck me. I remember when one time we got in a taxi cab and there's this gentleman that was driving us. And at that time I was, I think about 27, 28. And I remember talking to him and at the time my diary was pretty limited. I could have basic conversations, usually around the concept of numbers or, you know, costs, you know, but my friend that I was with, he had a much better grasp of uh, Dari than I did. And we were talking to this gentleman and asking him his age. And I, I just assumed looking at him, good, had to be a good, you know, 55, pushing 60 plus. And when he explained to us, he was about 38. And I, I remember just like, geez, looking at this guy, he looked well beyond his years. And that's what stress does to you. When you're constantly living in that environment, when things are tough, um, you just don't have to, you know, you don't really get to experience the fullness of life, the concept of health, and these different things that we enjoy here are, are pretty much gone. And when I was there, the average life expectancy in 2003, according to the UN, of a you know typical Afghan a civilian, I think was around 57. Uh, I'll have to go back and look at those numbers, but it was you know significantly low. In America, it's 77, 78, but there it was much lower. They had the highest infant mortality rate. All the different things that you and I take for granted, having a healthcare system, modern healthcare system, are gone just like that. Um, one of the things that I noticed is you didn't see people with different health issues like Down syndrome. Uh, the reality is they just couldn't make it. There was no health care. There was no medical attention, and they were often abandoned if they were seen as a burden. You don't have the resources. If that comes, you know, if you have a child with different um, you know, health deficiencies, the, problem, the reality is they're just not going to be able to make it. There is no support for them. So the thing that we enjoy so much here, the freedoms, the health, all those things, again, are gone. You just don't get to have that. The fifth thing that struck me was a lack of education. When I was there, uh, again, this is 03, when we had helped the Northern Alliance kick out the Taliban out of Kabul. Uh, When the Taliban was in power, they'd gone through and pretty much wiped out uh, the schools. Girls weren't allowed to get an education. You know, they had to wear the um, uh, burqa. They were kept in a, you know, basically at a lower level. And I remember I was trying to help these professors in the um, college there teach science courses, and I explained my background in microbiology. And they showed me their library. I mean, it had been completely demolished by the Taliban. And, you know, these guys didn't have any kind of resources or tools or education, any type of uh, material. It had all been you know, eradicated. And when you live in a post-war or live in a civil war environment or whatever you want to call it, great collapse, all these different things, great reset, Education has to unfortunately uh, go to the side of the road. I mean, it's, it's no longer a priority when you're trying to live day to day surviving. 
And again, we live in a country where we have these freedoms, we have the ability to put our children in school, we have a future, there's things that we can do. And I love the fact that our scientific community uh, is you know, it's so advanced that we have these different uh, assets in our country that make us uh, really great and special. And these things are not, uh, you just don't have these options when you're living in this type of day-to-day -day existence where, you know, again, you're just trying to survive. And one of the last points that I want to make, and this is something I alluded to a second ago, where, uh, you know, women were put in pretty much a second-class uh, position. Uh, when I taught in the U university, in Kabul University, uh, the women that came in and, and wanted to learn, that was new for them. They never really had that opportunity during the war at that level. Uh, again, when the Taliban were in power, um, women just didn't have that luxury, or they weren't really allowed to be um, you know, they really weren't allowed to have an education. Again, they were treated as second-rate citizens. And, you know, the things, the advances that uh, women have made in our culture, in our society, uh, over the last hundred years and over the last 30 years, a lot of those things would be gone. Uh, the advancements, you know, I have a young daughter, she's three years old, and I'm excited for the potential for her future, uh, the different possibilities, the things that she can do. And I, you know, I'm so encouraged and excited for her future uh, because, again, we live in a nation that um, has those opportunities. Whereas when I lived in a country uh, like you know, uh, Afghanistan in particular, those options just weren't on the table. And so I bring that up because a lot of the things that I've observed, you know, I, I hit different points, but the things that we enjoy, the freedoms that we have here, the education, the health, you know, the, the quality, all these things, uh, those are things I think a lot of times we take for granted. And those things would be gone in an instance if we went into a, whatever you want to call it, a great reset, civil war, go into a major conflict. While I don't really foresee us going into major conflict in this country anytime soon at a uh, entire level as far as across the entire country, um, I, I can imagine we'll probably see potentially skirmishes, probably like Ireland did during the 80s and 90s. I can't imagine uh, we're going to be able to avoid that if we continue on this path that we're on right now. But I bring all these points up because I just want my audience, I want people that watch this to remember and to think about these different things that we have, the luxuries that we have. I know we're living in a bit of a challenging time this year with the pandemic and the lockdown and people, you know, feel restricted and for sure. I mean, there's a lot of things that I would love to do and just haven't been able to do so. But nothing compares to what I saw firsthand when you're living in a country that's in a constant war or just coming out of a war everything is demolished. I had to hear so many stories of people watching family members murdered in front of them, being shot, killed, uh, different, you know, I saw the men all the time. A lot of, most of the men, well, not most, but a good chunk of the men that I saw walking down the street had one leg, they were on crutches because they had stepped on a landmine. And these are the things that, again, we take for granted, <laughs> the freedoms that we enjoy, the, the, the goodness that we experience in this country. So I'd love to hear your thoughts, any feedback, any questions, if you want to post those in the comments section below. I uh, always enjoy hearing back from the community. But I just want to throw my two cents um, into the ring on this. I mean, again, I was out here driving around, and this has been something that's been on my mind. And uh, love to hear your thoughts. As always, stay safe out there.